<laughs> I'm gonna leave that in. Hello, humans. All right. So today, what I want to do is go over an article that I'd written previously and just provide a, a video view of this article and like the some of the points in it. Um, and so really, it was looking at the kind of um, the environmental debate around Bitcoin and really taking more of an incentives view of that. So say, you know, in a world of finite resources uh, and where we could think about where those resources are best used and what's most important, it begs the question, why do we buy so much crap and then throw it away? And is there a way we can shift those incentives? And does Bitcoin indeed have a role in that? So that's what we're going to discuss today. Um, it's, I think it's a great article. I actually did pretty well this one when I put it out there and a lot of people were quite interested in commenting on it. It's really all about the, the notion of time preference and how the money that you use can really affect the way that society behaves. So, you know, please feel free to come in and have a look. But I'm going to go through some of the context on the whiteboard today and we're going to do that with the help of our human, Phil. So who's Phil? Well, Phil's 46. You know, he lives in the suburbs. He's got a couple of kids. You know, he's an Aussie. So his winters are all about AFL and his summers are all about nippers. He's a very busy guy. He's worked his whole life. It's not necessarily a job that he's enjoyed, but it's a job that he's had. You know, he's done all right for himself. He's made money. He's got his house. You know, he's still got a mortgage that he's paying off. He doesn't feel he can get out of work. And sometimes, like just here, just oh, just under the ribs, he just has that feeling that there's something missing. And, you know, Phil is like a lot of other people. And what Phil likes to do in that situation is sometimes he likes to buy a bit of crap. <laughs> so how does it work? And let's let's drill into it and look at some of the incentives that drive Phil's decisions whether he loves to buy some stuff or he decides to wait so this is how it works or more importantly it's potentially how it should work because we're going to look at a distorting factor in a moment now on the left here we see that Phil has human desire and human desire is probably one of the few infinite goods in the universe you know it, it only goes up there's always a little bit more desire for something that we could have never seems to go down but it doesn't mean that we always fulfill those desires straight away because of our good old friend economic calculation so when phil's thinking about buying some stuff he asks himself a bunch of questions and it can it can give him a little bit of pain here you know, sometimes it's just there a little bit of heartburn he's like oh you know what's, what's going on can I, and the sort of questions he's asking himself are, you know, have I earned this? Like, do I actually have enough money available to me to pay for this? And when he thinks about that, he doesn't just think about the number in the account. He, he thinks back and he says, oh, God, those hours, those hours and hours of soul destroying drudgery that I had to go through to actually make that money oh my god is it worth it for this fluorescent plastic surfboard with a shark propeller on the back that I'm kind of hoping will give the wife a bit of a fright in front of the kids and he says oh I don't know I don't know if it is or maybe it's the opportunity cost and he's thinking like oh if I didn't buy this ridiculous novelty surfboard what else could I have maybe there are other things maybe there's experiences I could have or I could go on holiday with the family oh, I don't know if it's worth it he says you know will it even last i mean it's a novelty surfboard <laughs> like how long am i gonna get out of this and he says oh i don't know he's just always pain in his mind and he just says like 80 percent of the time he, he's it's not worth it he's just gonna wait 20 percent of the time he actually thinks yeah i'm gonna i'm gonna buy the stuff and that's the break that we we really want on society to say look Nobody's making a judgment call about whether the stuff that you buy is worthwhile or not based on the inputs that you've put into it, which was, at the end of the day, your own time on this earth. You know, if you believe that it's worth spending that much of your time on earth to get this thing, then, you know, so be it. The only question that we ask is that you just consider whether it's worth it or not for you. Okay, seems fair. Now, there is a distorting factor in the world right now, though, which is that we don't we don't work in a sound money situation. I've made the joke before that, you know, you can have sound money or unsound money. <laughs> you know, like I don't know a person that would want unsound money. It sounds 
awful, like an unsafe ladder. Now, but we're going to move on and we're going to look at an unsound money world, which is the world we live in right now, where everything is really based on debt. So is debt going to come to the rescue? No, it's going to come to the not quite rescue, more to the fucking shit up in the long term for short term pain relief. So the way it works in the debt based world is instead of just having the economic calculation to make and this pain that he has to ration with to say, is it worth it? This guy, this guy's a real banker. And he's going to come along and he's going to offer Phil some money. And Phil thinks, fan bloody fantastic, free money. Like, why Why wouldn't I do this anymore? Like, opportunity costs, opportunity must. Like, it doesn't matter. I've got more money. I just get more money from that real banker over there that's giving away the money to me. This is fantastic. You know, have I earned it? Who cares? That's future Phil's problem. He could deal with that. I've done my work. I want to get the fun now. And then future Phil can work it off. So what happens in this situation of the free money is that all of us, as I say free money, it's more like cheap money. You know, Phil on his hamster wheel of working gets access to a lot of future debt because people make the assumption that, yeah, he's probably going to keep working. And it's in the banker's best interest, strangely, to actually make more of those loans, even if they don't come back and pay. But, you know, this is, that's, we'll get on to that another day. So the impact here is that we shift the incentives. And now 90% of the time, Phil's going to go buy the stuff. And only 10% of the time he's going to wait. Because we've really just ratcheted down the pain, which is interesting. But are there any other bad incentives that might? might play into this based on debt well and i'm gonna say yes it gets worse because it's not just the incentive that phil has it's the incentive that's built into the money he's using as well so because the money itself is debt you know dollars aren't backed by gold and they're not backed by bitcoin or something that's real in a place that's got a limited supply it's just debt it's debt issued against future productivity or assets that may come into being so this debt is what what you have in your account so if you have a positive account balance you think i'm debt free sort of it's actually a liability of a bank so you you kind of just owed the money <laughs> now this debt when something's based on debt the thing is you then owe a percentage against that so built into the money is this notion of return then because you've got this return this inflation against the debt um you have to issue more money to pay back the extra money that's based on the return of the money that they owe. So if you owe a bond, which is how the money is issued, over 10 years and that pays 5%, well, you know, at a minimum, we're going to be paying back an extra 5%. So we issue more and more money over time. So the longer the, the money system stays in place, the more compounding money we have to issue to pay off the debt on the money that we already owe. And so what that does is if you look at a value of a dollar against gold or against, certainly against Bitcoin or just against general goods and services over time, you'll see that since we move to a debt based system, it just goes down over a long period of time. So the value of all debt based money tends to trend down against goods and services in the economy, unless you have a really thriving economy with a lot of stuff getting put out there and just driving down the costs. Now, the problem with that is if the value of your money loses over time, well, you know, you've got an extra incentive to spend the money that you've got. Because if you wait and hold money, then the value of the thing that you want to buy is likely to go up against that money over time. So it makes no rational sense to save up money in an account to wait to buy a house. Instead, it makes a lot more rational sense to say, screw it. I'm just going to get the debt by as big a house as I can because the house is going to hold its value better than my debt. So again, we're incentivizing people to buy, buy, buy now instead of save. And so what I want to point out is that it really brings two worlds to light. So we have one world, which is our sound money world, which is your sort of gold standard, your Bitcoin, where you're incentivized to earn before you spend. And deferred consumption is rewarded. So if you don't spend your money, your money becomes more valuable and you can buy more with less money in the future. So it incentivizes you to not just go out and make rash purchases, but instead to hold on to your money because it will buy more in the future. And it actually also works well in a deflationary environment. 
so if less is produced it, it doesn't matter it, it won't fall over the system won't crash now in the debt money world you're now encouraged to spend before you earn waiting is punished so if you hold on to money hoping to buy a house well your house is just going to outpace the <laughs> outpacing capital growth the amount of money you can put away making it more and more expensive the longer you wait you're actually punished for not making impulsive rash decisions and buying stuff and then finally we've got that it requires growth and inflation so as we just went around in the little debt loop there it's built in by issuing money as debt we have to issue more money as debt to pay off the yield on the debt we previously issued and that just compounds over time and we get less back the longer it goes on so the question i first ask you is well which one do we think is going to drive better incentives for reducing the amount of overproduction in the environment and making sure that we're only really producing where it's required and solves a problem I'll let you make that decision. But before we go, I just want to leave you with one more final observation, which is to use the Anakin meme. You know, cheap debt leads to overproduction. And Padme says, but the debt is evenly distributed, right? Everybody gets the same opportunity. It's evenly distributed, right? Well, no, no, unfortunately not. Um, if you're a very large company or, you know, you're friends with the government, then you tend to get your debt at a much lower rate than everybody else. So what would happen if that were true in society? Well, you might see huge global conglomerates appear because they actually get access to cheaper debt, which allows them to buy more things more cheaply than their competition. So that could be access to facilities it could be investing in new infrastructure or it could just be buying out all of your competition and just quashing innovation and growth so if we were in that world what we might see is things like you know amazon get enormous <laughs> just buy out all the competition in the high street and deliver that service because mom and pop over here just don't actually have access to the same cost of money as amazon do they could try saving but we already know that their savings get devalued and it's just an unfair sort of playing field that's going on there so you'd expect to see this bifurcation in wealth in society where a few very large players get larger and larger and larger because of cheaper access to debt it allows them to buy up the assets and their competition making themselves larger and larger and that's bad because that exasperates the wealth gap in society. And what we tend to find is when the wealth gap in society goes up and up and up, we lead to war and revolution. So it's not something that we should be cheering on. All right, fantastic. So that's the, the guts of the article and some of the concepts at play. Obviously, head over to bitcoinforhumans.com and have a look at it yourself. I'll just click back. So it was called Consumerism, Rabid Consumption and Easy Money. And it really is all about, look, when we're looking at the impact that we're having on the world, we really should be looking at the incentives that are at play. This is just one set of incentives, which is looking at you know what how do we incentivize the way people act and like what they consume within a world of finite resources we can also look at some of those incentives around energy production and i'll get onto those in another another video so if you like that please like and subscribe check out the website sign up to the newsletter that's how i keep in touch with people so hope you've enjoyed that and have a great day